Well, good evening. So good to see you in the Lord's house tonight on this Wednesday evening. Beautiful, beautiful day. It started out a little rainy early in the morning, and then it uh, became a just a pretty, pretty day. Good, good to see you all tonight. Take a second, stand up, just look around at somebody, wave at them, say, I'm glad to see you in the Lord's house tonight, all right? <laughs> Sing with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. people said amen thank you so much please be seated pastor it's all yours brother. Oh, amen thank you brother mark all right we are we this is tonight is our quarterly business meeting and so we'll do that first uh if anyone needs a financial report or a business report could you you want to raise your hand up and we'll get these passed out all right, thank you brother all right
You were. Uh, I'll tell you one, one thing that, that has been on my heart a little bit, and I was, t- I was telling John about this, is we've got to figure out how to, and I know this has been an age-old problem, but how do you do business meetings and get more people involved? Because it, it's, we, as a, a church of our size, not that I have anything wrong with any of you guys here, but 60 people shouldn't be making big decisions. There should be more people involved in that and, and more people knowing what's happening and knowing what's going on. And so uh, we've, we, we need to work. I'll get our deacons to be thinking about that. We, can, we need to figure out maybe how to get uh, more people involved in, in something like that because it's just it's, people need to know. Here's what's going on in our church, and it's a great time for updates. And uh, some people just don't want to know that level of stuff, and that's okay. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll figure that one out. Uh, again, I know it's an age-old problem of when do you have them and those types of things and when do you get people involved. So, uh, But <clears throat> I just feel like as we continue to move forward, more people are going to want to know, especially once we start breaking ground and things of that nature. So, All right, let's jump into our prayer list, and we'll start looking at this, and then we'll dive into our Bible study tonight. <clears throat> uh, let's be praying for Robbie Harp. He's got a blockage in his intestines. He's improving. Doctors feel they can correct his intense intestinal twisting without surgery, so it's being prayer for him. Uh, Salt and Light Mission House, their needs uh, for April 24, shampoo and deodorant for men and women. These can be dropped off at the Mission House on Tuesday or Thursday or behind the welcome desk here at the church. And Miss Betty thanks, of course, everyone for the donations and all the help that they, uh, that they give. Um, let's currently be praying for our uh, country and our leaders. Let's be praying for the nations, as we know we've got persecuted Christians all across the world. Let's be praying for what's happening in Israel. Let's pray for peace in Jerusalem, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, people are making decisions right now uh, that could uh, cause a lot of other things to happen over there. And so we'll see if Israel retaliates with Iran's attack or not, but just be praying for that. Um, God's in all of that. God's sovereign. That, that, that's the thing, church, we always need to remember. As we're, deal, as we're hearing these things on the news, as we are going into a political season, as we're in a political season, moving into that, as you watch the news and see what's happening to different candidates and things of that nature, God is in control. This is not, nothing is happening in our world that is not under the control and purview of God. So we have to remember that. Like no matter how chaotic things look, God is not up there looking down going, Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I can't believe this is happening. Like That is not God's posture. God did not set the world in motion, take his hands off of it, and say, I hope it works out for you. And some people feel that way. That's not, that's not at all where we are. God is in control every single second of every single day. And so we pray, we do all that we can do, we do all that we feel led to do, and then we just trust God with the results. So, uh, But we pray. And I think that's the... That's the dichotomy of our faith sometimes is we have a God who we know is in control and sovereign, yet he tells us to pray. So we we, we try to figure those things out instead of just being obedient. We're never going to figure, do you guys know this? I I think you do know this. There are things in our Christian faith you will never figure out. You will never figure them out. There are things that, that, that run... For example, sovereignty and free will. You're never going to figure that one out. And John's old enough. He's a little older than I am. But John's old enough, like I am a little bit, to have seen the waves come and go, right? This isn't the first time people have been getting upset about sovereignty and free will and all that. It's just, it's, it's a pendulum swing. It's a wave. It's amazing. So, and until Jesus comes back, we'll try to figure those things out. Instead of just realizing... He's sovereign, and he told us to pray. So just, just be obedient. And I think that's the thing that we've got to remember is uh, he didn't call us to figure him out. He called us to be obedient. And, and, but, but I know that's hard because we want to know the answer. And so anyway, we, we have to lean on our obedience in that. All right. Uh, Tony Armistead, Ka- Kayla Colby's father, uh, prays there. Really felt like this past weekend he was kind of maybe moving to the end of his life, and he's had a great recovery. Uh, expected to go to a rehab facility soon, so we praise God for that. 
Uh, Alex Hemantoler, continue to pray for her. She had a, a cyst removed from one of her ovaries. She's healing well, uh, in pain, but, but Medina said she's doing well, so we praise God for that. Uh, Glenda Midget, she fell in her church parking lot on Easter Sunday and hit her head, <clears throat> but they said that the uh, doctor said she's doing okay, so be praying for her. Uh, Shirley North had eye surgery for glaucoma on the 15th. Surgery seems to be a success, and the pressure is down, so we praise God for that. Let's continue to pray for Darren. Um, he's at, he had foot surgery on April 4th. He's recovering right now. <clears throat> the last thing I heard is that, Pat, you can help us with this. He's going to the doctor tomorrow. Questions about his incision, maybe? Something like that. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. So be praying for Darren. He had a pretty complicated surgery on his foot, and so it's just a hard surgery. He has to keep it elevated. I know it's very difficult for him to stay seated and be elevated and all that. Just be praying for him as he's recovering from that. Uh, let's be continue to deal with, pray for people who are dealing with cancer that we know of in our church. Of course, Nancy Bain, she, starts, she started chemo already, and they'll be on every other Monday. Pray for her. Uh, Jay Barbier, he's a student ministry specialist for the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board. He's in stage three cancer, has progressed to stage four. Uh, he started chemo pills four days ago. No known tumors now, uh, so no radiation. And his lung surgery was a success, so we praise God for that. <clears throat> Sally Clark, pray for chemo treatments will work, and the side effects with her will be minimized. Uh, Dave Gordon, let's continue to pray for Dave as he walks through his treatment. Pray for Really, the biggest prayer right now for Dave is, is weight gain. Let's pray that Dave continues to, to gain some weight and he'll be able to eat. Uh, Jane Lynn Janke, uh, they've moved her to Pavilion on the assisted living side just so she can get treatment and get taken care of and seems to be doing well there. So we praise God for that. Um, and then Tracy Sackman started a new Stronger Chemo and be praying for her as she is walking through that. Um, and be praying for Tim Murray. Tim started his treatments and it's something that he will do every day uh, for, I think it's 28 days. So be praying for Tim as he is in the, in the midst of that right now. Just started that on Monday. Okay. All right. I know we, we got your mama on the prayer list. Tell me her name again. Barbara Dodson. Yeah, Barbara Dodson. Had a stroke. And uh, so we're going to we'll just put her on a prayer list. Uh, they're, she's at home and they're treating her at home for that. So let's be praying for Barbara Dodson. Okay. Who else? Do we want to be... We wanna, if, Yeah. Betty Ricketts. Ricketts. Yep. Betty Ricketts. Yeah. They had her funeral today. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. And let's, and let's be praying for Cindy Marks and her family as, as she's continuing to uh, grieve and get over the loss of her mom. Had her, her mom's funeral uh, last weekend. Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. Let me pray for us and we'll dive in. Father, thank you for this evening. Uh, Father, we want to lift up all that have been mentioned on our prayer list tonight. Father, thank you for our opportunity to pray. And Lord, thank you that, uh, that our ways are not your ways. And Lord, that, uh, that really leans more toward you. Your ways are not our ways. Uh, Father, you've got things that, that you've done, that you've set in motion, that we are just never going to understand and never going to be able to comprehend. And that's because you're God and we're not. And we don't have uh, infinite minds. We have finite minds. We have minds that have been tainted by sin. And so, Father, we can't understand. But, Lord, you've, you've not called us really to understand as much as you've called us to obey. And so we do that. We trust you. And our obedience comes out of our love for you. And we know that you, your love for us and what you've demonstrated to us. So the, one of the greatest parts of uh, John 3.16, Lord, is that you demonstrated your love. Romans 5.8 says but you demonstrated your love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So God, you've demonstrated your love for us. You didn't just tell us you loved us, you demonstrated your love for us by your son. And so I pray God that we would trust that and, it, and out of that love that we would obey and we would trust you and be able to do that. Father, I, I thank you for uh, this church and I thank you for their faithfulness and God, where you have us right now. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's an amazing place, Lord, and we're so excited about all that you're doing here. And I pray, God, that as we talked about this past Sunday, Lord, that you'd always keep us on the right side of the cross. Um, Lord, our, our tendency, our flesh wants to take credit for things that are happening. Uh, but, Lord, there's no way we can take credit for what's happening here. 
Uh, you're working, you're moving, we're trusting you with that, and Lord, we want to lift you up. You said if we lifted you up, you would draw all men to yourself. And so none of us, Father, can draw anybody to ourselves, but you can draw men to yourself, women to yourself, children. And we thank you for that as we saw the report of those who've come to be a part of Emmanuel over the last quarter. Uh, God, I, I pray for those families that have moved on to other churches. Pray that you would bless them and use them, Lord, as they've gone out to serve. Father, I pray as we enter our Bible study time tonight that you would lead us, that you would give us open eyes and open hearts to your word. Uh, it is your spirit that teaches us, and so we trust that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to look at the book of Philemon tonight. Now, Philemon is uh, a great book to look at because we can do it in one evening. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to roll through it. It's actually a pretty short book. There's a lot in the book of Philemon, uh, but, but I was kind of still praying through kind of where we're going to go on Wednesday nights. Um, I just thought, man, this would be a great, a great book for us to work through tonight because, again, it's a, short, it's a short letter, but it's a really neat letter uh, that I think you, maybe, maybe you've spent time in it, maybe you haven't, but I, hopefully you can, we can learn about Philemon. Now, Philemon, kind of being in, toward the end of the uh, New Testament, give us a little update on the letter to Philemon. Uh, it was written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. I don't know if this is tilted or not. Can you guys, is that okay? Okay. Uh, written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. If you remember, in his first Roman imprisonment, he was on house arrest. And so he was able to, to have visitors. He was able to write and do what he did, but he had to obviously stay in house arrest. So this, is, this letter would have come out of his first imprisonment there in Rome. Uh, it was his shortest letter that he would write. Of his 13 letters of the New Testament that he writes, it would be the shortest letter that he would write. Uh, it's the only letter where Paul doesn't explicitly talk about the crucifixion or the resurrection of Christ. Now, it's interesting that we just kind of went over what Paul said to the Corinthian church. He said, when I come to preach, I preach Christ and Christ crucified, and that's it, nothing else. And in this letter, which is interesting, and I'm going to tell you why this is, uh, he doesn't explicitly talk about or preach about Christ and Christ crucified, but he's going to do something in this letter uh, that he doesn't do in the other. So it's, that's why it makes it a very interesting letter to look at. Uh, now, this was a personal letter written to a friend and a fellow believer. So I think that's what makes it different. Philemon is different than his other letters because he's writing it to a friend of his. So this is really a personal letter Paul's writing to Philemon. That's who's receiving this letter. Now, in his greeting, he's going to greet the church as well. But this letter is really written about a personal issue that Paul is going to deal with with a person named Philemon. All right, the letter's broken up into three sections. Uh, verses 1 through 7 is the opening prayer we'll look at. Uh, verses 8 through 20 is Paul's request to Philemon. And then verses 21 through 25 would be his final greeting. Now, Paul, this is what makes this letter interesting, is that Paul will use a personal letter to give us a perfect picture of the gospel. And I believe that's why uh, the Holy Spirit included it in the canon of Scripture. Uh, you know, there's a lot of letters that were written other than what we have in our 66 books of the Bible, in our 27 books of the New Testament. There were other letters that were written. There were other gospels that were written. There were other epistles that were written. But they weren't included in the 66 books of what we have as our Bible. The Holy Spirit guided that process. And I've said this before to you guys, and if you ever have anyone say to you, well, how do we know that the Bible is true since it's been interpreted all of these years? Well, our answer is very simple. The same person that wrote it is the same person that has been guiding those interpretations all of these years. The Holy Spirit made sure. Do, do we not think that the Holy Spirit cannot make sure that when, when a group of, of people take it to create a, a, a translation of the original languages, that they're not going to get it right? Of course, because he wants to preserve truth for us and for all generations. And so we have that, and, and I think this is why we have Philemon. Interesting that you have the same kind of thing happening in a book in the Old Testament and a book in the New Testament. Now, let me, let me give you a little Old Testament quiz. What book in the Old Testament does not mention God? Esther. Esther. Right? Is it Esther or Ruth? It's Esther, isn't it? Yeah. Esther. So you've got the kind of the same thing here. In the New Testament, where you have Paul writing a letter to Philemon, but he doesn't explicitly talk about uh, Christ, the crucifixion, or the resurrection. But he, but he does paint a beautiful picture 
of what the gospel looks like. All right, so let's dive in. The setting. So Paul was under house arrest in Rome when he meets a runaway slave named Onesimus. So Onesimus was a slave. He ran away from his responsibilities, which were under the purview of Philemon. Now remember, when you have slaves, the scripture is going to refer to Onesimus as a bond servant. So what a bond servant was is when a servant, if, if you remember, you had what they called, um, I can't remember the, the, the fancy name for it, but it was servitude. When, when they owed a debt to someone, a lot of times what they would do was they would sell their, their life or their work into paying for that debt. When that debt was paid, then they were freed from their slavery or their service. Okay, indentured servant is what it's called. And so basically what you had in a bond servant was someone who was released from their service but yet they liked working for that individual. So they would continue to work for that individual. And that's what we see in Onesimus. He was called a bond servant. So he, but he ran, away, he ran away from his responsibilities. He ran away from uh, what he had to do for Philemon. And so he runs into Paul in Rome. Now here's what happens to Onesimus. Onesimus runs into Paul and Onesimus gets saved. He comes to Christ And now Paul's going to send him back to Philemon to make things right. So that's the setting of this letter, okay? So you've got a runaway slave. Here's Philemon. And and, and we're going to, I think I'll talk about this in just a little bit. Philemon lived in Colossae. So you've got Philemon in Colossae. His his indentured servant, who was a bond servant, runs away, leaves his responsibility, goes to Rome, runs into Paul, gets saved, and Paul says to him, As a matter of fact, I actually know Philemon. I know him well. And Paul is going to refer to that back in this letter. And then he sends him back uh, to Philemon. So, so, So basically, the letter to Philemon is setting up this whole scenario so that when... And and guess who delivers the letter to Philemon? Onesimus. Now, Philemon is going to be asked to do something that will demonstrate his faith. Okay. All right. So let's get, let's get into it. So here's Paul's prayer verses one through seven. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our dear friend and coworker to Aphia, our sister to Archippus, our fellow soldier and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So let's talk about the players that Paul references. Number one, Paul refers to himself. He's the author of the letter, but notice how Paul references himself. In other letters, he calls himself an apostle of Jesus. In this letter, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus. So why would Paul call himself an apostle in the other letters that he wrote, but in this letter, he calls himself a prisoner? Because he actually was a prisoner. But the reality is, is that he's not writing a letter to a church where he had to establish his authority. When he wrote a letter to a church, he he wrote a, a, a letter to a church in the authority of his apostleship. Here he's just writing a letter to a friend. And so he references himself uh, as a prisoner because that's exactly what it was. He's just merely describing his situation. Now, notice this, and and I think this is important. Um, A prisoner of who? Well, I thought he was a prisoner of Rome. That's a huge point right there that that we would miss if we didn't stop and pay attention. Paul sees himself as a prisoner of Jesus and not a prisoner of Rome. What's the difference? Yeah. One sets me up as a victim. The other sets me up as just following my master. Does that make sense? He could whine about being a prisoner of Rome. He could whine about getting thrown in prison and it's Rome's fault and it's somebody else's fault. He didn't see it that way. He saw himself in prison because that's where Jesus wanted him to be. Talking about the sovereignty of God, he understood, hey, I'm a prisoner of Jesus. Now, Rome may think they're holding me. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm here because of my Lord and Savior. He has a purpose for me being here. Isn't that a great perspective? Isn't that a great perspective on life, even in difficult circumstances? You know that there was more that Paul wanted to do. He wanted to go to Spain and do ministry there. But for now, he was a, he was a, he was a prisoner of Jesus. 
and not a prisoner of Rome. So he didn't put himself in the, in the victim slot. Can't believe this happened. He understood that where he was is right where God wanted him to be. All right. There we go. Timothy is mentioned. Timothy, he didn't contribute to the writing of the letter, but most believe he was mentioned because of his possible acquaintance with Philemon. So Timothy wasn't there or a part of the writing, but he would be obviously mentioned because he was Paul's traveling companion. Philemon, to Philemon, he was the recipient of the letter. Now, he, he hosted a church that met in his home. So again, here's a guy fairly wealthy. If he had indentured servants, he was obviously fairly wealthy. He had a place in Colossae that was big enough for a a church group to meet. We're talking about 20 to 30 people, not like ours. And that's because you got to remember, that's how they met. They met in homes. Small groups of people would meet in homes. And so Philemon hosted one of these in his home. Much like when we were in COVID, we couldn't meet in here. But we still had some groups meeting in their homes. 10 to 15 people would meet, watch the service together. Kind of that type of situation, okay? So isn't that interesting? Isn't it just interesting that we fussed and fussed about, well, we didn't fuss. Well, some people did. Anyway, we got upset about not being able to meet corporately. And what it did was it just threw us back to the first century. That's what it did. It threw us back to meeting in smaller groups. Because that's what the New Testament church did. They didn't have corporate worship like we have corporate worship. They just met in small groups, okay? Uh, Aphia, he mentions Aphia. Most people believe that that was was, uh, Philemon's wife. And then Archippus, most people believe that that was Philemon's son. So these are the players that are involved in this letter. Now let's start looking at the prayer. He says, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love and faith toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Wow, this must be a great guy. I mean, the way Paul's talking about him, he must be amazing. Well, maybe Paul is setting him up for something. Okay, notice what Paul does first. First, Paul affirms his love for Jesus and the church. Okay, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love and faith toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Philemon, you love Jesus. I know you love Jesus and you love the saints. You love them so much you let them meet in your home. Like you're, Philemon, you've got that part going on and he affirms his partnership in the gospel. This is an important word when he, when he says in this verse, uh, your participation, that is the word koinonia which actually means partnership or fellowship. He said, I pray that your partnership in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. He's basically telling Philemon, we're partners. We're locking arms together in this mission to show the world what it looks like to be followers of Jesus. Okay? Three, he affirms his disposition to the saints. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Wow, what a great guy. And I, and I wrote this down. This may not be correct, but it felt this way to me. You ever felt like you were in a conversation and you were kind of being set up? <laughs> I mean, like he's just, man, Paul's just painting it on. Now, it's not that any of these, none of these things weren't true, but he was, he was reminding Philemon of who he was in Christ before he asked him to do what he was going to ask him to do. Okay? All right, so let's look at the petition. Verses 8 through 20. And I'll, talk, I'll make some points and then we'll look at the verse. Here's the first one. We must always consider our approach. All right? Always consider our approach. For this reason, now, to, now for this reason, that's what makes me think it was kind of the, like I'm going to, tell you all these good things about you. Now, for this reason, although I have great boldness, now watch what Paul does. I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right. I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. Now, what is the difference between commanding and appealing? 
Now think about it because we do it. We do this. We do this primarily with our adult children. Yeah. How many of us still command or try to command our adult children? Right? Here's, here's, what, here's what Paul says. I could command you to do this. I could pull my rank. I could stand in my apostleship. And I could tell you as the leader of a house church in Colossae, you got to do this. But he said, I'm, I'm not looking for you to just rotely obey because you've been told to obey. Here's what I want to appeal to. I want to appeal to you in love. Philemon, I, wanna, I want you to understand this and I want you to do this because it is the right thing to do. Not because you've been told to do it, but because it is the right thing to do. Man, do you guys remember when we were raising our kids and you try to figure out where that right time is to kind of stop commanding and start appealing? Because, it's, because at some point, if you just keep commanding, the only thing they know to do is what you've told them. And at some point, they're going to have to think on their own. And they're going to have to figure it out themselves, right? And I was telling this story the other day. You guys have heard me probably talk about this. Where my, when I was in college at UK, I had a black Volkswagen bug that didn't start. So I had to push it to start it. So I would push it, jump in it, and I would down the road I'd go. Pop the clutch and just go. You do what you got to do, right, to get, to get to school. And I'll never forget, I went to my dad one day, and I said, Dad, it's getting the winter. It's, it's hard to park downtown in Lexington. Um, man, I, I really need to figure, I, I, this, my car won't start. He said, well, you better figure that out then, should you? And I said, well, yeah, but I need you. He said, no, you figure it out. You can push it to start it. You can figure out how to, how to make it work. And he said, now, there's probably a wire that goes from the key to the starter somewhere that probably isn't there. So you figure that, you figure that one out, Jethro. Okay. So sure enough, I figured it out. Thing fired right up. At some point, you got to figure things out yourself. Now, trust me, I'm preaching to the choir. Because I am a part of a generation of parents that still want to do everything for their kids. The problem with that is, is that they'll let you do things for them, but they don't want you commanding them to do anything. Right? It's just reality. At some point, we just got to be, a, we, just, we just got to appeal. It's kind of like when you've got a, a child that doesn't go to church and they know when mom calls, that's all I'm going to hear. That's all I'm going to hear. Instead of appealing to them in love. Hey, listen. Man, I just want you to know, you know I love you. And I'm just the best thing for you guys. To, just, just appeal in love. Appeal in love. That, that's what Paul's doing here. He, and so when it says he's appealing on the basis of love, what, what is he referencing right here, do you think? What is he referencing right there? He's appealing to the fact that Jesus Christ lives in Philemon. He's appealing to the love that lives in Philemon. If the Spirit of God is in Philemon, he's appealing to that. Not commanding him to do something. So, I think there's a good lesson uh, for us in that as we think about considering our approach. Because he's going to ask Philemon to do something pretty difficult. Okay? All right. We must learn to view life through the lens of the gospel. That's exactly what Paul does when he appeals to Philemon. Listen to his appeal to Philemon. Paul as an elderly, so I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Now remember, Onesimus is the slave, runaway slave. I fathered him while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful to you and me. I'm sending him back to you as a part of myself. I want to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but out of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but even more to you, 
both in the flesh and in the Lord. All right, let's break down uh, this view. How do we start? How, do, how, did, how did Paul view this situation through the lens of the gospel? Because, guys, that is what we have to learn how to do. If we're going to survive in this world as followers of Christ, we have to learn how to look at life through the lens of the gospel. Because we can do, we can look at life a couple of different ways. We can either look at life through the lens of the world. And this is, this is what's sad, guys. This is what most people do. Most people want to look at life through the lens of the world and then have Jesus to kind of grab him when they need him. All right, so that, that makes us basically deist because we don't really want God in our lives and we feel like God kind of put things in motion and left them by themselves and we just kind of holler at him when we need him. Or... Or we look at all of life through the, a completely different worldview. That now there is a sovereign God in my life controlling my life, leading me. He, ge- he gave me his spirit that lives inside of me, that seals me for the day of redemption. So I know that I'm his. And he's leading and guiding me every single day of my life. Even when I don't want to be led, he's working on me. He's shaping and molding me. He's conforming me to his image. So if I believe that, I've got to believe that everything that happens in my life, and I know we've got a lot of questions about that. Again, let's go back and understand we can't figure it all out. But we know as we look through the lens of the gospel, I see it differently. Now, I want you to notice how Paul sees this situation differently. Because as Philemon is reading this letter, how could Philemon have, have, how do you think Philemon has seen this situation? I mean, here's a guy who lost something that, that, that owed him money, that had responsibilities to him. He ran away from him, and he's out there somewhere, and that's all Philemon sees. Now, I can't speak to how Philemon saw this. All we have is how Paul sees it. But if Philemon could have seen it this way, well, now he's reading a letter from Paul. And Paul's telling him, hey, by the way, I ran into your buddy Onesimus. And let me tell you about this guy. Listen to how Paul saw it. And, and again, we're looking through the lens of the gospel. The gospel makes us a part of a family, regardless of who you are and regardless of what your past was. But I, Paul, as an elderly man and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains. Man, here's a guy who was a criminal. Do you know that in Roman law, when he returned back to Philemon, Philemon had every right to have him executed? Every right. If Philemon wanted to follow the law, he could have had Onesimus killed when he shows up at his doorstep. But here's what Paul says. Hey, listen, I met this guy and and he became a follower of Jesus and now he is my son. You know what's interesting is that Paul looked at Onesimus just like he looked at Timothy. Now, you go, wait a minute, Timothy, man, that's like preacher boy. That's like his protege. You're right. But Onesimus is just as valuable to him as Timothy was. Well, how can he be? He's a runaway slave. No, he's not. He's a follower of Jesus and a child of the king. You ever have problems forgetting somebody's past? or maybe your own, and not realizing that when we become a... See, that's looking through the lens of the gospel. The world looks back, the gospel looks forward, right? What did Paul say? Forgetting what is behind me and pressing toward what is ahead. That's the gospel, okay? So that's what Paul does. Secondly, the gospel makes us useful for the kingdom. As far as Philemon could have been concerned, Onesimus was useless, Paul even says that. He says, once he was useless to you, he's, he's, a, he's a runaway. He ran out owing you money. But he is now useful both to you and me. Isn't it amazing that, that when we come to the gospel, the gospel changes our lineage and it changes our usefulness. It changes our purpose. But now you've got a runaway slave who Paul says, this guy has value. Because that's what the gospel does. The gospel brings value to our life. The gospel makes us one in the body. 
I'm sending him back to you as a part of myself. Now, what was Paul saying right there? I'm sending him back to you as a part of myself. That's exactly right. He's saying, when Onesimus shows up, it's like me showing up. So when, so when I show up, Philemon, you treat me a certain way because of our love for each other and our appreciation. And so when Onesimus shows up, you treat him like you would treat me. I wanted to keep him with me. Listen, listen to Paul's talking about his value. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, <clears throat> he might serve me in your place. Now, what did he just say to Philemon? Philemon, I've kind of been wondering where you've been, son. I mean, I'm in prison. Hadn't seen you lately. So I wanted to keep him so he could serve me in your place. <clears throat> but look what he says. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. So he's recognizing that relationship that Onesimus and Philemon had. <clears throat> so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. You see, he wanted to choose. And see, look, look what Paul's doing. He's kind of, again, developing on, uh, Philemon's response. Philemon, if you chose when he comes to you to send him back to me, let that be your choice. But you're going to be the one that does that. I'm not going to command that. That's going to come because you have had a change of heart because of the gospel. <clears throat> and here's the most important piece to me, I think, is that the gospel gives us such a different perspective. Man, listen to this. Now, now listen, this, is, this is crazy. Because remember, what Onesimus did was considered a crime. Punishable by death. Now, watch what Paul says about it. For perhaps this is why he ran away. That's mind-blowing to me. That Paul is not looking at this. Now, check this out. Paul's not looking at this as, well, he did a bad thing. But you know what? God can make good things out of bad things. That's not what he's saying here. Paul is saying Perhaps the reason he left is so that he would meet me and get saved. Listen to what he's laying on Philemon. Okay, by Paul, well, let me read it. That might ask you a question. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother, he is especially so to me, but even more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What's he doing right there to Philemon? If that's not a setup, I've never seen a setup. I mean, you won't talk about being called on the carpet. He's basically saying, hey, listen, you, can you, Philemon, can you see it this way? Well, I don't see it that way. He belonged to me. He owes me. He ran off on me. He did, rit, 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 right? We could easily find ourselves there. But look at the Apostle Paul, the prisoner of Jesus, reshaping a difficult situation, right? Because you know what? Philemon needed this. Philemon needed a brother to step in his life and start reshaping a difficult situation he was dealing with. You ever had somebody do that for you? You ever had a believer step into your life and start reshaping a difficult situation for you, helping you look at it differently, see it differently, have a different perspective on this? Is it too much of a stretch for us to think about um, Jane Lynn being in pavilion because there's somebody there that needs to see her spirit and her heart for the Lord? Well, no, my mom's got cancer and she's being treated. Okay, well, let's reshape that, right? Let's, let's look at that differently, okay? Let's, let's take any situation that, that we walk through that's tough, you know? 
Our, our, our deacon and friend Tim, who's, who's walking through his treatments. Wes, when you walk through your treatments. You know, all of the stuff your mom, as she's going through what she's going through. Let's, let's reshape these situations and say maybe. And I, and I love what Paul says right here. Perhaps, for perhaps. Can, can we start asking, can we start making that kind of statement in difficult situations? Perhaps. There's something else going on here that we have no control over, but that God is directing. And maybe we can't see it, but God can. He's telling Philemon, hey, Philemon, the only way you're going to do what you need to do is you've got to see it differently first. Right? Guys, listen, the only time... And I use the word repent because we think about that term so negatively, but it really is a great word in our life. The only time that we repent of our thinking is when we start seeing things the way God sees it. And when you start seeing it through the lens of the gospel and, and, and being willing to ask the for perhaps question with your mom, Janet, right? You know, just perhaps, perhaps. We have to start looking with a different perspective. All right. Now watch Paul demonstrate the gospel right here. This is amazing. So here's what Paul does. So he basically tells Philemon what he wants him to do. Receive him back as a brother. He's coming back to you, and I want you to receive him, not as a runaway slave who deserves to die. I want you to receive him as a brother in Christ. Now watch what Paul does. He demonstrates the gospel. And, and, and I'll give you the points and I'll give you the verses because this is the gospel. Number one, Jesus stands in our place. Listen to what Paul says. If you consider me a partner, accept him as you would me. So here's what Paul tells Philemon. Philemon, when he steps on your doorstep, accept I'm standing in his place. So don't see a runaway slave, you see me. Is that not the gospel? Is that not what Jesus Christ said he would do for us? Jesus Christ says, I will stand in your place. When you stand before my father and my father looks at you and you have to give an account for your sin, I will stand in your place and I will say to my father, when you see them, look at me. Because I'm substitute, I'm standing in their place. And that's the essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ stands in our place. That's what, it's what Paul is asking Philemon to do. And Paul is willing to do that for Onesimus. Secondly, Jesus paid our debt. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. What a great, what a great passage right there. Where's Paul right now when he's writing this? He's in prison. Absolutely. Because you know what he didn't know? He didn't know how Philemon was going to respond to him. You're exactly right. He was willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel. What did Jesus do for us? He paid our debt. Think about this talking about you and this is Jesus speaking to the father if you consider me as a partner accept him as you would me if he has wronged you in any way which he, we know we have and he owes you anything which we know we do charge that to my account you know what every single one of our sins got charged to Jesus account every single one of them Listen, the ones you're going to commit on the way home and the ones you haven't committed yet. Charge to Jesus. Charge to Jesus. He paid our debt. I don't know that Paul was a man of means. We don't got any record that Paul was a man. He, he was a tent maker. And he's in prison. But he looked, at, he looked at Philemon and he wrote in this letter, 
you charge that to my account. If he, whatever he owes you, whatever debt. Now, did Onesimus deserve that? Did Onesimus do anything to earn Paul being willing to pay his debt? No. Just like we do nothing to earn Jesus paying our debt. And thirdly, Jesus reconciles us to the Father. Yes, brothers, may I have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I hope that through your prayers, I will be restored to you. So what does Jesus do for us? He reconciles us back to the Father. That was, it's amazing to me when we read that 2 Corinthians 5 passage of scripture that I reference a lot because I, I think it's the essence of the gospel is that the father is in the reconciliation business and he's reconciling the world to himself through his son, not holding their sins against them, but providing a way for them to know and be in a right relationship with the father through Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul wanted Philemon to do. You see, here's what Paul was asking Philemon to do. Philemon, I need you to just exercise and live out what you say you believe. Philemon, what happened to you in Jesus, I need you to do that for Onesimus. That's it. You just live out your faith. Now, you know what that is, guys? You know what the essence of that is? The essence of that is this. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. You see, what is, what is our call? Our call is to love people as we have been loved by Jesus. And that's exactly what he's asking Philemon to do. He concludes the letter this way. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. Uh, Philemon would have known all of these guys because they would have been involved in the Ephesian work. That's actually where Philemon met Christ, was in that work in Ephesus. He goes back to Colossae and helps start that church. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. What's interesting is that Paul would write back to the, he would write a letter to the Colossian church, which Philemon would have been a part of the Colossian church. And Philemon would have heard this verse that Paul wrote in the book of Colossians. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, watch this, slave or free. When Philemon heard that, do you think he questioned who Paul was talking about? No, because Paul knew when, when Philemon looked over and he saw his buddy Onesimus, he said, that's exactly what Paul's talking about. Because there's no difference between him and me at the foot of the cross. But Christ is all and is in all. Isn't it great to know that Jesus Christ has no classifications? We're all the same in Christ Jesus. You know what we all are? Children of the King. That's what we are. Now, you may think, no, I'm a forgiven sinner. Well, here's the deal. You can look at it one or two ways. I'm going, I'm going to be a child of the king knowing that I need his forgiveness. I'm not going to wallow in, in, the, in the reality and possibility of my sin. I'm going, to, I'm going to live in the victory of the king who calls me his son. And if we do that and have this gospel perspective then we can live our lives in a way that the world will see who Jesus is. Guys, let me tell you something. <clears throat> Evangelism really isn't as hard as we make it. It's really not. Evangelism is about people seeing people live a different way. That's all evangelism is. It's people seeing people live a way that has a gospel perspective, just like Paul is writing back to Philemon about a runaway slave who met Jesus, and he's, he's, he's reshaping this for him so he can see it through the lens of the gospel. Man, when people watch us walk through life through the lens of the gospel, let me tell you what it's going to do. It's going to stir their interest, and we will have the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. It's life and words. It's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. 
And both are needed so that people can see that our life is not shaped by this world. It's shaped by a gospel, a good news from Jesus. All right? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for a short letter called Philemon that gives us a picture to see Paul reshaping a situation in one of his friend's lives that will help him see clearly what the gospel really is. Lord, he challenged Philemon, he demonstrated the gospel, and then he sent Onesimus. I thank you, Lord, for a runaway slave named Onesimus who had enough faith to take that letter back to this this slave owner, this man that he departed from, that he committed a crime against, trusting that his faith was stronger than his rights. Lord, let our faith be stronger than our rights. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. I look forward to seeing you Sunday morning.